This is the NeoBooks call for Monday, September 23rd, 2024. Um, good to see you all. The uh, day before my birthday. Oh, no kidding. Well, happy pre-birthday day. Yes, yes. Uh, prelated, I like to say. Prelated, I like it. Rather than belated. Yeah, that's so much better. It's like you're you're being a little early. It works well. Um, significant uh, on birthdays. <laughs> good, there's Klaus. Um, and we're off. Hey, Klaus. Uh, you're muted. Yeah. I thought my setting was to unmute everybody when they joined the room, but Jack's just joined and she's muted. So I've got to go check my settings again because my default on all rooms is that they're not muted when people join, but that's not happening. So. Hi. Greetings. Hello, hello. Hello, Excellent. hello. We are just now getting rolling. Um, we should catch Marc Antoine up a bit. Um, I'm unclear on which sort of things. We have a couple of different interesting things cooking. Uh, Jose described to us his Our Projects project. Uh, which, protocols. Uh, sorry, Our Projects project. That's very funny where my brain went. Our Protocols project. Uh, which got us uh, quite interested about our protocols around NeoBooks. And there's a, a couple of different sort of pieces we can talk about there. Uh, we've, we've got a variety of sort of uh, NeoBooks in progress that we can go into in different ways. Um, how else can we bring Marc Antoine up to? I, I'm uh, forgetting uh, half the things we've been talking about. I know, I know you have a lot on your plate and catching me up might take a lot of, of your time that's meeting time. I mean, I think go ahead, do your thing and I'll try to see how much I understand and I'll ask questions. Um, thank you. Sounds, uh, sounds like a, a deal as far as I'm concerned. Um, good. Um, Anybody, uh, anybody want to start in on some place that we were last time um, or pick up on any of these threads? Uh, well, one of the threads that we had uh, talked about um, was the similarities between um, our protocols and NeoBooks. And the, the question of, is there enough similarity for us to work through a um, some kind of, of structure that helps us learn from either side of that dividing line of the difference between the elements that make up a protocol and the elements that make up a nugget, uh, a neobook nugget? And are they really all that different? Or are they sufficiently consistent that we can actually um, devise a, a similar protocol of, of the structure of these, um, the data structure of these two elements? And so for me, that I find that interesting because we don't quite have, to my knowledge, a NeoBooks um, data structure, um, then maybe the idea of, of starting with that as an opportunity to explore that conversation on the NeoBook side. Um, I'm very happy to talk about that. Um, my, my quick answer to that is that, uh, as far as I can tell, um, an R protocol would be a specialized version of a NeoBook nugget very easily. And it would include a frame or, or, or format for our protocols specifically, but I can't see that that frame or format would apply to all nuggets. So Agreed. yeah, yeah. And then, and then also uh, there would be metadata associated with our protocols that would make it in our protocol and visible as such and, and so on and so forth. So that would be super cool. Um, so, so it seems that, you know, all or all our protocols could, can, could conceptually be NeoBook nuggets, although that would mean we would have to invent that format and figure out what it means and define it as an R protocol. Uh, this thing folds back on itself nicely, mm -hmm. uh, and that would be a fun thing to do. Uh, one of the things that we had come up with, uh, I guess maybe even two calls ago from just our, our conversation about this, was two starting points. And I think these starting points lead to um, 
to some of this, but we were uh, we were interested. At least I was very interested in working on some art protocol suites for NeoBooks, which which is a collection of art protocols that make up how we work uh, in NeoBooks. What a NeoBook is, how do you contribute to a NeoBook? All those things could be a set, a suite of art protocols, and then separately and relatedly, uh, we had done some work on a generative commons agreement, which is hey. Uh, I'm in Open Global Mind and NeoBooks and all sort of related projects, when we get together, here are the rules of the road, which would easily and nicely be a set of our protocols. So I'm very interested in both of those as starting points. And I mm -hmm. think and I think keeping this notion of how do our protocols and, and NeoBook nuggets feed each other uh, is a very nice uh, thing to hold as we do that. Does that make sense, everybody? Any thoughts, questions? Yes, that is the our protocols in question. Mark Antoine. Very much in beta. Yeah. I guess it would really help to have an example. You know, this is too abstract for me. Um, cool. Uh, so, I mean, an R protocol for NeoBooks, I'm just going to make this up on the spot, uh, could be that uh, we prefer NeoBooks to be uh, open content. Uh, and uh, there are a variety of ways of doing that, but, and, and, and Jose, sorry, I'm, I'm just sort of making this up as I go. So you could actually turn this into what would feel more like an R protocol when I'm done. But, uh, but, you know, there are some cases in which people will write an, a, a neo book that they mean to be private. And I, I, in, in my brain, in my mind, I'd love for that to be an exception to the rule, not the rule, because one of the goals of NeoBooks is to make uh, information, to make ideas more useful and more available in the world, and that which would be maybe a meta R protocol as well. So, so there could be this sort of overarching R protocol, which is about the goals of the project, which would tie back to things we've been trying to write about what is the, the NeoBooks mission uh, and, and how do we articulate that. Uh, so there could be an overarching one, and then there could be a specific one about when writing a neobook. Uh, here are the kind of IP considerations, in which case we're favoring uh, CC0 or uh, copyleft or some other kinds of, of uh, licensing that, that frees the information, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that doesn't mean that every neobook needs to do that. It just means that if you're if if you if you're doing something different from that, and this might be part of the R protocol, you would want to call that out as an exception because uh, you know this follows all the R. This <clears throat> so this book is follows our, our follows the NeoBook conventions as our protocols except for this, this, and this, which would then be oh, and by the way, this is a CC attribution and no 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 commercial use, et cetera, et cetera, and that's how it's different from it's it's, it's basically a uh, but everything else about NeoBooks protocols might be acceptable uh, to that author. So that that's kind of how I'm envisioning it, Klaus. Uh, does that help make sense of it? And also, Jose, can, do you want to elaborate on, on what I was just trying to play out? Well, I, I think you're, you're right on as far as there's some higher order uh, protocols, and then there's some really detailed protocols. And I think everything in between nests inside of these things all the way down to um, a nugget is, you know, roughly this big, it has these parameters, it works this way, and it looks this way. And this is, um, in order for us to, to utilize nuggets across, they need to have these metadata, uh, as an example. And so, that's at a pretty granular level, but that starts to give us an understanding of the structure of the data that is interoperable. Because if we just simply have a paragraph of text, uh, that paragraph of text doesn't know what it is. It doesn't know where it belongs. It doesn't know who its parent is as far as uh, conceptually what, it, what it's uh, behaving like and so forth. And so it's about that structure, building that structure um, as well at, at a very um, granular level. And that structure is within some mid-level um, protocols that define what um, Jerry was describing of how you can use it, what you can use with it, and so on and so forth. And then these higher order protocols that are more of uh, values-based, you know, we're doing this for this purpose. And for these reasons, and we'd like them to be and the, uh, behave in this way. And so 
Um, I, I think we could start <laughs> anywhere on all of this, but I think there's there's a lot of layers in this that then repeat themselves in neo books, in the individual neo book, uh, because many of the neo books then will deal with many of these issues at those different levels as well. Can you and offer so, an example of that? Well, I, I think uh, Klaus <laughs> has uh, many examples of that in, in his work. Uh, he's got some higher order statements that are very big, you know, uh, soil feeds the world, basically. Um, and and then has some really low level things that are, uh, we need to have these microbes and we need to have these chemicals and we need to have these, and, and, and they add up to uh, being able to have a scalable food system that is functioning, um, that add up to the ability to have that food hit our plates in, in, uh, uh, in certain regions, in certain ways from regional food supplies to this ultimate higher order thing of we need to figure out a way to have regenerative food um, that isn't destroying the soil, that isn't destroying the quality of our food. So, so just to riff on this, um to see if I'm understanding it. So Klaus uh, could write a book in which he makes some, some very concrete recommendations about measuring soil fertility or whatever else it might be, which could then be spun out of the book as our protocols or connected to the book as our protocols themselves. So here is here is a way to determine what the, you know, what the soil uh, fertility is on your plot of land. That sounds like the, the framing of an R protocol. I would say that's true, but that wasn't my point. It was just simply that the structure itself of these nested yeah. concepts uh, was really what I was speaking to. But yes, and you could then go on either side of that divide of, of the book versus the uh, protocol. Go ahead, Mark Anton. Thanks. Uh, two things. One, some of the examples you gave of higher level uh, protocols sounded more like goals or criteria of evaluation than protocols to me. And I wonder if these, if it would be beneficial to distinguish those. Uh, I'm thinking about frames as the general thing that encompasses a lot of these things, uh, whether it's procedures or criteria or goals and uh, events. And it seems to me protocols, it's very clear to me what a protocol is. I did read through the, 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 the surface of the R protocol page. But when you speak of the higher level, it seems to me, yes, there is such a thing as specialization. And there was a question about inheritance versus composition, right? In some cases, the protocol would have sub phases, which are their own protocols, such as subsequences. Mm -hmm. In some cases, you take a protocol, I mean, when Jerry was saying, accept this, I think for me, that's inheritance. You're saying that protocol, accept these changes. Um, I think there's there'll be also a very important process of specialization. This is the broad protocol, and here we made it, uh, we modified it in this way for these special circumstances. Yes. Uh, those, those would be relationships between protocols. Um, and I think that's that's worth exploring. What are the relationships between protocols besides those we named? Uh, but I do think, is everything a protocol? Like when we're speaking about criteria, of course, there's a protocol for evaluating the criterion, right, right. <laughs> which is distinct from the criterion. And it's distinct from the criterion under evaluation or the application of the protocol under evaluation, <laughs> right? Those are all distinct things. But does that mean, am I making sense? Absolutely. Okay. And yeah. I think that clarity, I think, um, is part of what we need in, in understanding not only on the protocol side, but also on the neobook side, because I think the same applies on the neobook side. I suspect. I would expect, yes. I just posted uh, a link to my website. <clears throat> 
where I have one uh, location designated to what I do with neobooks, you know, and how I uh, mm. how I use them to basically program chatbots, um, and and then and I actually uh, uh, you know published these two books that I that I have so far. Um, and so you can click on it and you get into the neo book itself and it's not specifically uh, 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 framed or you know made pretty or whatever it's just a, a google document um so so i look at this and there are very specific nuggets in there which you could take out you know i mean there's like theory U is a dedicated nugget right that, uh, or spiral dynamics you know or so they are and particularly in the second book, um, which is leading from the future, um, these are almost all freestanding nuggets that are combining in the, into uh, a story, but they, they are really uh, quite uh, independent from each other. So I have not thought about protocols in doing this. I mean, in fact, I, I, uh, I don't know how, I mean, I, I can't, I don't process how a how protocols fit into this picture you know, I, I mean i haven't advanced my thinking yet to understand how that works or or, or what i should do you know, to apply let's say protocols in the way i think about building nuggets into this book jose do you want to take a crack at that i mean Klaus, from 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 all i've heard and all i imagine about the realms you care about uh, they they seem rife with opportunities to do, to define protocols and 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 share them out about how do we fix the food system uh, all the intermediaries how do we do information brokering like like uh, think think of this imagine if you were to do like one of the how to like WikiHow is a how to wiki website right that got really popular uh, imagine that an R protocol is like a, a collection of WikiHow things that are defined a little bit more precisely so that they're not just here's how to tie a bow tie, but rather here's here's a, a, a protocol approach for tying a bow tie. Maybe I'm, I'm I don't know if that's helping, but. Well, I, I think your point earlier, um, Jerry, about protocols that that uh, Klaus could then be derived from the books that he's writing. I think that's really interesting, right? Because he, when he goes to his constituencies, whether it's farmers or the food uh, supply uh, folks and so forth, that he can take these narratives and say, here's a protocol of how you could deal with soil in this instance. Here's the things you want to keep in. Here's how you do it. Here's the, the processes. And, and be more explicit about, and that's what our protocols is about. It's not waiting for the government to tell us what we need to do and make the laws and make the regulations, but for us to actually build protocols that help us do what we need to do. And that that stuff that we do ourselves is irritable. It, it, we can iterate over it. I like irritable right. better, better yeah. than iter iteratable because it's easier to say. <laughs> um, and and that that the way we do it is collectively, collaboratively, and and that to me is is the beauty of of our protocols is an idea of what used to be rules turning into our decisions and our ways of helping ourselves rather than waiting for somebody to tell us what they are. And so if if you and your community, and I'm not proposing anything, I'm just saying that that's an opportunity that Jerry pointed out. If you and your community decided, hey, we've got a protocol around how we're going to deal with this aspect of food, then that becomes not simply a narrative, but an actual protocol that's explicit and, and well-described, well-defined, and people can adopt it and use it because it shows them how to do something. It tells them how to do something and they can alter it. They could say, oh, here's version one was great. I want version two. Let's go do version two. And then others can adopt version two. I can mm -hmm. easily envision uh, an, a Gen AI app that would go through a, 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 a text, a corpus, and pull out and even draft 
the protocols from it. If 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 it understood what a what an R, what an R protocol is well enough, um, Klaus, you wouldn't have to go think about this. You would write more Neo books and then feed them into the maw of this app, which would then churn out a bunch of protocols. And if it knew about the general body of our protocols, it might find neighboring our protocols or already already pre-written ones that fit what you've done and just say, oh, we don't need to write a new one. We'll just use this our protocol over here because it fits exactly. Because you don't want the you don't want everybody and every AI sprouting new our protocols, I don't think. I think we right. want some convergence among them. Uh, and to the point where I'm, if I'm starting a new company and I want it to be a multi-stakeholder cooperative, I would just pick Jose's suite of multi-stakeholder cooperative R protocols because I we've done this before and add water, stir, and you have a multi-stakeholder cooperative, right? And then I, I also wanted to mention that the, the topic for this coming Thursday's OGM call uh, was proposed by Sam Shikowitz and is about governance models. How do we backcast our way to governance models that work or coordination models that work? And we've talked a bit about governance and coordination before, but I think you might really like it. And I, I, if you don't show up, I'm gonna mention the R protocol stuff we're doing here in that call, because I think it's a component of a path to self-governance. And then I'll add one more lateral thing, which is I have an extremely libertarian friend uh, who's very dear to me, uh, who hates government for all sorts of things. And he thinks that most regulation should be industry associations, for example, that get together and say, here are the standards for what electrical connectors and work and quality should mean, as opposed to government regs to, to specify all that kind of stuff. Uh, that That's his bias. And I think that emergent suites of protocols kind of do that, right? Exactly. They, they, they offer a platform, a place, and a process for better self-governance among interested parties if this turns into a high-functioning, healthy process. Mm. I can't make Thursday. I'm going to be traveling for the next four weeks. But I can, I mean, from, from the way you describe this, um, it's all, it, it it's, could be like a meta-level governance. Is that sort of a fair way to look at it? I mean, for example, I just published a paper yesterday that like instantly had 4,000 hits. And it was about uh, replacing uh, corn biofuel with, uh, uh, with uh, 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 hydrogen fuel, you know, made with solar panels. So where you use 14.5 million acres of corn for biofuel, you can create the exact same energy on about 400,000 acres of distributed bio uh, uh, solar panels you know, to split the uh, the, the uh, hydrogen and the, you know, the water uh, into With water. Yeah, and and so <clears throat> and, and it had you know, just some amazing feedback because it was like an aha for, and for a lot of people who are working in this industry, never thought of it kind of thing. Can you post so, it in the chat when you're done explaining it, please? Sure, sure. Thanks. So. Uh, um the the you you could i mean the the when when i think about you know, the, the way i think about this is the 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 overarching paradigm is to protect soil and to facilitate the regeneration of soil right and then and then coming out of that there are certain mandates like do not grow stuff on soil uh, that is not designed to feed people, right? I mean, don't grow you know, crops for bio Fuel, right? or, or for animal feed and, and stuff like this, right? So, um, so you could you could develop you know, sort of a, a series of protocols that define um, some ground rules, right? Is that sort of fair to say? Yeah, and then nested in those would be, as, as Marc Antoine was saying, different types of definitions that speak to either what's nested underneath this or what's a derivative from this or what's about the goal of this process versus uh, the how-to of this process. Yeah. Yeah, or it would refer to them, yes. Mm -hmm. the, the, the whole question for me of protocols is they're one component of of an ecosystem, they're an important component. But for example, if you want to say, let's coordinate how we do things, uh, there's 
coordinating on the goals <laughs> first, which is distinct from coordinating on how we'll achieve these goals and how we'll measure these goals. And um, the I certainly wouldn't want only industry to define the goals, but then if you decide, you know, it's not a rigid standard, but it's a supple thing, then what are the, what I see as really useful is being able to say, well, we created this exception for this reason, and let's make this a micro experiment. Uh, let's try this out in a limited, uh, you know, in a limited sandbox and see how does this compare? And then having a kind of even eventually public citizen science about how does this version compare to that version? And that way, I'm a bit surprised you speak of versions as sequential numbers, because it seems to me there's always going to be concurrent versions of any protocol, and they need to be seen as these are the things we're trying. <laughs> and they are concurrent. Yeah. So we could have 500 of the, of the same thing, 500 versions of the same thing. Yeah. Uh, where different people are trying different ones and, and the ones that over time prove themselves are the ones that more people will adopt, hopefully. Yeah. Do you see a hierarchy in that? Within a, within a, 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 a specific... So I, I think of a, a protocol as an answer to a question. Okay? And so uh, a protocol is simply how do i x and if it's how do i x or how do we x more importantly then then how do we x whatever that thing is has other things that are bigger than that one x right and has other things that are smaller than that one x so there are hierarchies this way but what we were just talking about is that there are many versions of how. And the version of how in California might be very different than the version of how of, um, you know, Spain or New Zealand and or a different group of people in a different ecosystem. It doesn't matter. But the opportunity to have specific protocols that answer the how for this community that this community chooses to uh, to adopt, then that it, I don't see it as hierarchical at that level. I see the hierarchy above and below that specific how. There, there, there are there's a hierarchy of abstraction. Like if when you go when you refine when you say this is a more localized, more precise version of this, then there is not exactly a hierarchy, but a network of updates like this has been shown to work better than that in those circumstances. So it's it's sometimes it's a down, it's clearly an improvement. That's rare, but it, it can happen. And the, if, if the NeoBooks concept works right, then the R protocol is the mushroom, the fruiting body out of a discussion around how best to cure migraines, how best to make corn more, more you know, healthier, whatever. Um, it's it's how, how to do this thing. And that activity, that question could be an active discussion with scientific communities, with evidence, with whatever. And then out the side comes right now, as Marc Antoine just said, right now, this is the best practice we've found for doing this. And here's the protocol. Here's here's how we define it. But that that gives you this this nice sort of flexible thing where it's not that this is definitively for all time, the the fifth commandment. It's that this is the state of the art of what we know right now. And if you wanted to make this better, go over here next door to the to the conversation and join the community and do some research and whatever it is. And then this fulfills like a, a big hunk of my NeoBooks vision too. And then that same piece or there are protocol could become a piece of national policy and could, be, could become a part of a political platform. Like, wouldn't it be cool if Kamala said, here's the suite of our protocols that we would implement. This is uh, this is our version of Project 2025. Here's the version of, of humanist protocols that were coming that are emergent and came from the ground up that we want to make sure happen in our administration. That'd be really awesome. Hi. Now, the moment you get into the political process, <clears throat> um, I think there are desperately needed protocols. That, uh, but that's why I come back to hierarchical, right? Um, 
because when you when you look at how many decisions are being made, let's just say at the farm bill level, which is the second largest bill in the, in the United States government, um, um, a lot of these decisions omit any kind of of uh, reference to externalities, right? I mean, who cares? And so, uh, uh, if you have a protocol that mandates the respect towards nature and uh, avoids you know, externalities that are creating damage to watersheds and soils and people's health and all of that, um, then then that's a hierarchy, right? And then out of that comes the how-to and then there are you know, tons and tons of, of uh, options on how to, to materialize that. Um, a <clears throat> separate thought, uh, <clears throat> uh, recently, the Supreme Court had a really controversial decision where they overturned Chevron deference, which means uh, it used to be that legislation could pass an act that was relatively vague, and then it would go to regulators in the agencies that knew a lot of stuff, and the regulators would actually write the regs. Um, Chevron deference allowed that and gave the regulators the power of making law at that level. The, 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 the SCOTUS just overturned that and said this, uh, this thing has to go to courts almost every time, which is terrible. So it'd be very interesting. There may be an opportunity here for communities to emerge the, our protocol suites that work for them and propose those so that legislators can point to the our protocol suites and say, oh, this is what we're including that came out of the community as our set of regs. And you can take that to court all you want. You can have discussions, uh, but but that would be super cool. Separate thought, which is, uh, the, uh, as Klaus said, the moment you start to put politics in this, things get a little hairy. That's my paraphrase of it. Um, but one of the things about the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, that we were marveling at in a recent call is that it has managed to resist the politicization of infrastructure that has polluted other sorts of forums and other kinds of attempts to create national policy, international alliances, whatever else, around telecoms. That I, IETF seems to have a high-functioning process, which would be described in a set of our protocols, of course, um, for how to come to agreements that seem to work. So those are two separate but related thoughts about the broader vision for what this project might be. Go ahead, Mark antoine the, the I totally, on the one hand, I'm very excited about that idea. On the other, uh, it's it's good to think about opportunities for sabotage. Uh, how would companies try to infiltrate the process? And I think it's, and I think this is why it's really important to separate goals and means, because uh, experts are great at devising the best means of, you know, it's an optimization problem. That's what experts do. Uh, but setting goals is a community thing, and we want to make sure that the community is not uh, infiltrated. So that's one thing. But on the other hand, I really like the idea of we tried this, it worked in this community, and more important, we tried something else in this other community, and maybe they both work, or maybe, you know, maybe there's a common abstraction, maybe not, maybe it needs to be localized. Uh, that is what Astrom was saying about commons, that it needs mm -hmm. to be local governance. There, I'm I'm perfectly happy about, and I think it's 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 something that the government should look at. It's not so much reducing regulation, but some things benefit from being standardized, and some things a bit less so. But on the other hand, if you can set the goals, and and you know different communities can look at implementation. I don't know. Uh, the, the one thing that bothered me earlier when you said all this fits in the neo books, you know me. I'm when we're looking about multiple concurrent things, and not sure it's best presented in a linear fashion. I think we'll want other displays of information than purely linear, or even granular. We'll want tables and uh, graphs and all kinds of hypergraphs, of course. So, so the, I'm just. I'm just saying the the abstraction graph or the revision graph or things like that. Maybe a new book is not the best way to think about a bunch of protocols in their globality. However, of course, it's a very good way to present the result of the reflection and to say this is what we looked at. 
And this is how to make sense of this protocol. And yeah, finally, oh, sorry. One, one last, last thing. Uh, I hear a lot about, at, at the beginning, I thought protocols were about the protocol of building the NeoBooks. And then I see protocols presented within NeoBooks. And I don't know if that was a conscious shift, but both are important, right? Because obviously, how you collaborate on a NeoBook is a, is a protocol <laughs> conversation. Mm -hmm. That's a bit of a, I'm just saying I'm, Yes, I was just going to say that it was Jerry's turn to to jump in and, and describe um, his vision of new books as not a book mm -hmm. when you speak to linearity, right? And I, and I think I'm I'm now grasping uh, Jerry's understanding or definition of of new books as it's really the nuggets. It's like neo nuggets rather than neo books. That could be the future name of this. I'll go buy the domain now. Um, and, and the books, I think Jerry used as sort of a hook and he describes it that way. Um, but the nuggets is, is how do we think about things in, in a, rather than looking at this big narrative and, and talking about how the narrative spins out and the narrative is and isn't and this and that and the other, and we get lost in what are the nuggets, <laughs> right? We all want that. Like we ask a friend who says, oh, I, re I recommend this book. And say, like, what are the nuggets in this book? Because I don't want to freaking read the whole book, right? And so how can we get to talk to the about the nuggets and not so much the book and the author? Um, and, and could we do this collaboratively? Could we do nuggets collaboratively? It's hard to do books collaboratively, but can we do nuggets collaboratively? Sorry, the go ahead. No, no, I, I, I think I grok that much about the, the NeoBooks idea. Uh, I'm really curious how you see this happening. I do believe that as long, when I say linear, I mean language. As long as you're using language in the nuggets, we're, we're caught in too much linearity from my taste. But that's me. I'm looking at nuggets as structured information. But that's, again, that's my bias. It has to be both, most likely. But I think you need something that is not just language and the nuggets over Would say more up, please so I, yeah. I, i'm not sure i understood fair enough um i'm for me a lot of the what we communicate what are the nuggets we use language to communicate obviously but the ideas are structures it's saying you know, this this is a situation, and in a situation, there's many actors interacting in certain ways, and maybe uh, friends. Uh, so it's more than just a situation. It's about change of situation. It's a higher level thing. And then, oh, if we did this, the situation would change in that way, and the, the trend would shift, and so on and so forth. These are all uh, pretty complex objects uh, when you speak about an intervention, which is probably a protocol. A situation, which is a set of stocks and flows, if you use, for example, a system dynamic representation, which is one among many. And um, the I'm interested in things that can be composed, computed, uh, and, and stuff like that. Language is very imprecise. And again, that's fine because it represents imprecision of our knowledge. But it also, sometimes, you want to say, well, here's what we do know, and then you get into painstaking details nobody wants to know about. Uh, so, so there's this kind of weird equilibrium to find. And, and of course, the real answer is both. You want to convey things in language, but have the detailed structured information, but as structured information, you're speaking data structures. I want, you know, uh, I want a dynamic model with uh, um, error bars on the uh, on the flux and stuff like that. This is not something you want to put in text, but it's as much part of the nugget for me as the other one. Or or a, a Bayesian causal, causal graph. If we do this, this is the most likely outcome, and this is sec and this is the likelihood of this one. And how do these things impact one another? Those are structures that for me are part of the knowledge we're trying to convey, and we use language because that's what we know best. And of course, every Formalism has a learning curve, and it's difficult. But the whole point is, can we, A, embed 
or, 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 or not embed, crossbred the, 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 the language and the formal language. And uh, so that people who don't know the formalism yet can approach it through the language, but also the language might point to, well, these are the elements that are part of the formal thing, and this is how you could approach it. But also it allows for computation on the formal system, and then you can, somebody who does understand the formalism can check, oh, if I say this, does this work? Or is that incompatible? And, and then you can be very precise about things. So that's what I'm I'm trying to do about knowledge presentation. <laughs> that's my yeah. interest. There might there might be a little analogy here. Jax is making me think of uh, protein folding experiments, and yes. where Gen, Gen AI was just sicked on proteins and told to go, "Hey, we only know like a thousand of these proteins. Go, can you go figure out the structure of the rest of them?" And it did a really nice job on a whole bunch of proteins. We had no idea how they're structured, but they're structured in three dimensions, and I, I'm pretty sure they have a temporal aspect to them as well. Uh, that we're not that we're sort of still uh, amateurs at understanding, uh, and so when you flatten that, when you sit on them and turn them into letters, like the second illustration that Jack's put in the chat, that's very different from the fold at home illustration that you can rotate in three D space, which is different from the thing that may emerge in ten years that gives us an even better representation of the thing. And Jax, I hope I didn't steal your thunder right now, but you were about to jump in. No, no, you did a great, better job of it than I could. <laughs> That's because my mind's trying to put together visuals as we're talking way through this because we're using language in a very linear sense here. And what we're talking about is not bound by language. It's actually bound by concepts. So Mark Antoine, I think that's what you were saying there. And so I was trying to do that translation, which took me to these here, um, it, which is a, a way I hadn't actually thought about nuggets. But really we, we're thinking of we've got, We've got a we have got classes uh, the information, then we've got how um, how it's regionally specific in an area, and that might look like this, and then all of a sudden, then it's in in time, which has another piece here, and then it changes the shape of it. Um, exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Concept representation is hard, uh, and, and and again, the the there's no question to me that if we want to have collaboration, we cannot ask people to bow to a specific formalism because learning formalism takes time. On the, other hand, on the other hand, I don't think it's a reason not to have formalism. Can we allow people to contribute in any which way and have people who are skilled that translate to formalism do so? And what you Maybe just... LLMs also, but then you yeah. need somebody who's skilled at the formalism to check it. So that's the same. You need... It's about crowdsourcing the difficult part, which is making it formal. And then saying, okay, formalism, you'll realize, uh, well, there's many ways to interpret this natural language statement. And then you can ask, oh, did you mean this or did you mean that? And this is where the benefit of formalizing comes in. It's like you realize there was ambiguity that nobody had noticed. And making it formal forces you to make things definite. And maybe it was neither, and that's fine. And then maybe we need to extend the formalism. That's fine too. But uh, the, 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 the notion that formalism is one way among many of making things more precise mm -hmm. and avoiding one of the traps, which is people saying something and somebody else in, interpreting it as something completely different. Which happens a lot. Like, which is ambiguous, which happens a lot. Which happens a lot. Um, so what... Marc Antoine is saying, and I am not the best abstract thinker. Marc Antoine has like several layers above me uh, in, in his ability to think abstractly. But what you're describing there is really key to the big fungus idea that I'm trying to propose. And so, uh, separate from Neo books, but absolutely related to Neo books, for me, the space where we share what we know and what we believe is what I call the big fungus. And it, it, it's a it's a fungal metaphor because mycelia are so cool. Uh, but also because our ideas need to reach out to each other and interpenetrate each other like mycelial uh, networks. Uh, and in order for me to be able to share my brain with people who are using Kumu or other visualizations or uh, uh, Neo4j or whatever, whatever, we need the kinds of formalisms that Marc Antoine was just talking about somewhere in the middle as meeting grounds, as protocols for connectivity or something like that. And one of the thoughts that's crept in recently since the onset of uh, LLMs 
is, oh my gosh, maybe we feed each of these models individually to LLMs and the LLMs are the connective tissue and we don't really get to find out what protocols or what representations they used internally to figure that out, but they can answer collective questions across representations that are very different from each other. And Mark Antoine, I feel the same way about this, but I'm not seeing that the formalist logical way to, to resolve this is actually making a lot of headway is, is the problem. And if we could create connections into you know, uh, large language models to do this, maybe the large language models in their intense form of hard one internal representation are creating a meta map that works that way. But but they're only communicating in language and because they don't have even short-term memory as such, uh, there's, it means you, if they make a mistake, they won't even be able to, they're not that good at explaining it or that, you know, like, oh, you're right, uh, I got it wrong and let's do that. But it's uh, there's no coherency. You need somebody who understands what's going on to validate. I totally believe in the value of LLM as being one of the inputs saying, well, this is kind of the most probable, hence close to majority opinion, in, like su su super informed, magically super informed majority opinion about issue X. And that's dialoguing, but that is extremely useful. Like you can say, okay, this is what the majority opinion about this is, and this is where I differ, and this is where I agree, and I didn't see that aspect that the majority sees. Super useful. Sometimes you can force it to go a bit beyond that, but whatever it comes out is majority opinion. It's not, uh, I'm sure it can be made to translate into formalisms. But I'm, and I'm all for using it for that, but that means it becomes a contributor. And I see LLM as a contributor, a super informed contributor, but not a super smart contributor. Mm -hmm. That means I will want, no matter what happens, to have it be a crowdsourced and checked by humans. And, and checked by LLM, sure, but checked by a plurality of voices, of which LLM is one that happens to be extremely uh, has great advantages. It's, 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 it's not too lazy. It will always give a comment and, and it's super informed, but it is one country. It's one voice among many. Um, I, for one, welcome our new software overlords, just in case they're looking at this transcript later on and discover that some of us weren't that happy about their participation. <laughs> just kidding. I... Just kidding. Uh, 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 uh... I, I, I think I think Roko's basilisk uh, <laughs> is a very bad paradigm for which to think about these things. But oh well. You know, talking about overlords here, uh, that's a crazy word. But <clears throat> I think the idea of um, of of inserting AI into this process is sort of attractive because um, <clears throat> it 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 would help to to identify and extract flaws in logic, right? Because we may be all convinced that uh, um, these paradigms are all you know, well thought out and, and we're all in sync, but there may be contradictions inherent there that are not readily apparent. Um, and the one thing that I've found, I mean, I'm working only with ChatGPT because I don't want to, you know, experiment and I've trained you know, one uh, uh, ch uh, chat GPT, which is uh, incredibly uh, intuitive, interacting uh, with me or I'm with it, whatever. Um, and and oftentimes, you know, it, it points out that these two things don't go together. Um, so so to have uh, to have uh, sort of a logic check you know, using AI for that, I see, it seems to sound attractive. I, I'm I'm working with uh, with a group who's working on automatic fallacy detection, uh, and they've got some pretty nice results getting an LLM to identify fallacies. Now, there's something called the fallacy fallacy. Uh, it's not because something's a fallacy that it's wrong. Most fallacies are heuristics. That means they have conditions 
under which they might even be true and, and critical questions that say, here is what you should watch out if you try to use this as a heuristic. Watch out for, sorry. Uh, and so I'm trying to rethink the work they're doing in terms of identifying fallacies and mistakes, in terms of identifying what are the things to look out for when you're using this form of reasoning. And, I, and for me, that's kind of the, the, the next level of abstraction in frames, right? Uh, the frames about how we reason. And the next level up is the frames about how we interact. Uh, those are fascinating protocols. How we, and how we decide given many reasonings, why would I believe this form of reasoning rather than that form of reasoning? Why is this criterion more important than that criterion? Or what's the trade-off? How do we choose where the trade-off equilibrium lies? These are all uh, fascinating questions. And yes, I agree. LLM should be an actor pointing out fallacies because they're undefinable. That's beautiful. And, but, and it, but, it may, but it could be wrong. <laughs> yeah, no. But it may not necessarily be a fallacy. I mean, just, just one example. When I published this... Um, uh, hydrogen paper, um, hey, we can free up a half a million uh, or, or no, 14 million acres of uh, farmland that's currently being abused. Uh, the next question comes, what are you going to do with all the farmers who are making a living there? Right? And and so so it is simply looking at the externalities uh, that you know, one uh, 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 criteria that sound, sounds perfectly logic and absolutely the right thing to do uh, you know, that it rolls into so it's basically a systems thinking approach right that uh, um, oftentimes exceeds our information our capacity to you know our skill sets and all of that yeah, stuff to totally and and, and and our attention and there I totally agree launching an LLM and giving it specific instruction how will that affect X how will that affect y how will that and having this be systematic uh, systematically checked for any proposal? Uh, and maybe one that will try to find new externalities, absolutely. But here I trust humans more to come up with the externality that the machine didn't see yet. So happy because... to hear you say you trust humans. That's good. Uh, well, the, the so far, uh, the 4.0 uh, um, GPT is, is very much a linear thinker, right? Now, the next release, you know, the, the, the release 5 uh, is supposed to come out, that will look for inferences. So, so that uh, is going to open up, you know, a completely different uh, way of, uh, of 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 thinking about systems and the implications of it. It's actually quite scary to think about it. The O is uh, it the O? Oh, sorry, you keep going. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jack. Oh no, I did. I I. I... I haven't seen, I haven't heard about the five version, but I know that is it O one, um, the the preview that the I've been the strawberry we named O one is that the thing you mean? The it's strawberry? a precursor. It's not. It's that not is strawberry. Yeah. It's not what you're saying there, class. No, it's not yet five. Um, right. It's it's sort of a precursor transition model, and it, it it's high. I haven't really worked with it yet. It's it's released in beta form only. Yeah, I've had I have used it a bit, but I'm just wondering if that is um it would be interesting if you do I mean I know you're not experimenting, but if you get a chance um to see if that's sort of going towards where you're talking about. But uh, um uh but I didn't want to interrupt because this was a good flow of conversation. Ma Marc Antoine, um keep going. No, 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 no. I, I was just I was just saying I'm a bit I haven't played with 401 yet. Uh I think it is a bit beyond linear, but what is also clear is that the energy consumption is exponential uh, because 401 is, has to try many things. Uh, that means it's using much more than LLM, which we're already using way more energy than reported. Uh, there's actually new new reporting about how ridiculous, uh, how 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 companies doing uh, AI are under-reporting their carbon footprint by a factor of 15. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, 
yes, AI will do more. It's still being trained on texts by which have passed a certain vetting process, which means they come from people who write who are still a fraction of the population. I mean, we, we could have more diversity than what we get from AI. I'm not saying they're not useful. I think they're extremely useful. The, the fact that we can apply them uh, en masse to a lot of proposals is going to be incredibly useful. But we have to have it be, everything they do from my viewpoint needs to be one voice. Among, and, and, and that means part of a conversation where we say, oh, is it right about that? Any statement has to be contestable. So we've, we've come like dramatically long ways with the neural nets and deep learning and Gen AI and all that kind of stuff. It's really, really gone far. But I have this funny feeling that it's by, by no means tapped out. And there's a bunch of people saying maybe this thing has plateaued already. But we're just getting into the research for collaborative models where, okay, so here's a result from one model, here's some other models. How do they negotiate what they find out? How do you know, uh, fact checking, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, the optimization of hardware is just happening now. Like we're getting, you know, chips dedicated to these operations, which greatly reduces the processing, you know, it slashes the processing times in some cases, because all of a sudden you have a chip that knows exactly what to do. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are there are definitely dangers at the fringes. Like, oh my God, if these things start training themselves on synthetically generated data, then the snake is eating its own tail, and then we all die because knowledge goes away. Maybe uh, there's certainly a lot of dangers. But but I, I have this feeling that we have not seen the end of this progress for now. And and I will also note that progress like this often happens in big step functions. And you know, a report I wrote about neural networks a long time ago was described a step for a long time. Like like things stayed static for a very long time until processors caught up and more researchers were at it and so forth. So, but we're 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 still in the process of this major step that started you know November December of twenty two when these things got public. That was a huge step up that's not done yet. I agree that it's not done yet, and I want to. I really like that you. Uh, pointed out the issue of the, the multi-agent and negotiating knowledge between LLMs. I think I think that is important. And I think this is important for us humans. Uh, and, and we'll circle back to neo books, actually, in oh, the good. sense, what is important, most important, I think, for humans is to think about how do we negotiate common knowledge? Like we have knowledge coming from one another, and now from AIs, and how do we judge? Judgment is a human capacity, I think, still. Uh, because again, it's about criterion and goals. And goals are human prerogative. Uh, how do we judge? How do we synthesize? How do we go from this knowledge to something we can understand? I mean, we're still far from explainable AI. Yes, there's progress to be done, but it's to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and weave that into the kind of stories our brain can absorb and integrate from diverse viewpoints, whether they be machine or human, into a common knowledge we can use to live in common and act in common. Uh, and, and that is the real puzzle, right? What What are the... We have ways to integrate knowledge between in small teams, sometimes sometimes up to tribe level. At higher levels, we do majority rule. We, we, we basically use representation to boil the problem down to the known problem of working in smallish teams. Uh, because we don't know how to aggregate human scale knowledge. But the reality is even a House of Commons is not able to integrate all the necessary knowledge. You, you spoke of the problem of expertise with Chevron. Uh, you need expertise uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the right level and from so many disciplines to take informed decision on system issues. And this is where I think there's so much progress to be made at the knowledge integration layer, where no matter where it comes from a human or a machine, we have to make a 
coherent, understandable story out of it. And we're still not that good at that. And the, 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 the problem of taking the nuggets and making them into a story, yes, that's the neo book problem. But the, the problem of making, at some point, there'll be a lot of nuggets and they won't fit in one thing that can be read. And how do we, again, synthesize between nuggets is going to be a really interesting problem. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the problem. And, and this is where I believe that formalization is useful because it's easier to compare formalized nuggets than informal nuggets. Because it's easier to compare more precise, less precise linguistic information. And unfortunately, language is often very imprecise. And in, in certain settings, imprecise knowledge is intentionally put in, like in patent applications, so that they get broader patent you know, uh, reach, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we have to deal with that as well. But then you're also looking at a nugget that is freestanding perfectly right on its own. But when you insert it into a different context, now you have issues. Right. That's that's absolutely true. The the uh, and this is why you need to have this hierarchy of abstraction I spoke earlier. Here's the specific nugget, and here's the more abstract nugget. But abstraction is not the same as vagueness. It's about saying I have chosen to abstract away this dimension and this dimension, and this dimension intentionally, and you know what you've abstracted away. It's not the same as vagueness, where you don't know what's being abstracted away and what's supposed to be precise. You know, this is really a perfect example. I'm just like in a flinger here with a guy with some Christians, you know, on LinkedIn who are contorting themselves into pretzels to explain why they are supporting Trump and why uh, they have a biblical context to, to do this. <laughs> and so, and so uh, I mean, you, you, you absolutely need a hierarchy here, right? Um, where, yeah, you can make this, this, you can pick this nugget out of the Bible that seems to support you, but when you place it into the context of, you know, the bigger story, then, wow, we have issues. So the... the of course there's issues. It's not like the Bible. It's it's a neo-book. It's not like it, that, like it's internally consistent or anything. <laughs> but it has hierarchy, you know? I mean, it, it does have... Uh, um, I mean, love your neighbor, right? Uh, you know, love the stranger. I mean, there, there, are, there are certain things that, that are expressly uh, uh, defined as hierarchy. Um, and then you have all these other random scriptures, stories uh, that you could use to justify something entirely different. No, no, but the, the, the whole point, the whole point is it was, um, it came in layers, right? But there was no refactoring to say, oh, actually, this statement invalidates this previous statement, right. which it did. I, I dated but... a very religious woman long ago, an undergrad, I think. And uh, one day she says, oh, yeah, everybody knows that the New Testament basically obviates the Old Testament. And I did a triple take and I'm like, wait, 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 what? It does. I mean, it's supposed to. It does. So I had no idea. I had zero idea that that was true. I'm like, the Bible. It's like the Bible is, is like New Testament, Old Testament, like two parts. Okay, fine. We take the whole thing. And that's why people quote things in the Old Testament so often, right? So if you're telling me it negates or obviates or obsoletes or replaces the, the Old Testament, then why is anybody ever quoting anything from the Old Testament? Because that's where you can substantiate and support <laughs> your crazy statement. But, it, but it's canceled by the New Testament. I don't get it. Like, if well, well, not, not, not is everybody agrees to that. Yeah, yeah not everyone not, agrees. Yeah. I know. And that's the other magic is that one of the crazy things about for me about the Bible is that it's so reinterpretable and so malleable that you can use it actually to justify a whole series of atrocities. Right. And, and that's not good. Mm -hmm. why we need neo nuggets that's right and maybe a neo bible <laughs> can we should we write a neo bible <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, well, so a neo nugget solve that though can somebody take a neo nugget for the for the bible it, is that the question it, no not necessarily no it doesn't solve it yeah not at all i think the bible is an insoluble uh paradoxy paradoxical dilemma yeah. and, conund and conundrum all wrapped into one 
Yeah, sorry. No, what I mean there is, will the um, not necessarily. Yeah, uh, right. I, I don't want to start solving the Bible. We, <laughs> there, <laughs> there, there's not enough time in the entire history of humanity to solve the Bible. But um, the uh, my my thought thinking there was, what's happened with the Bible, and we're quoting it around all these different places. If we were if not if when we go when we've got these neo nuggets out in the world and there's a couple of them now but when there's a lot of them will they become yeah will they become um can they be can can they be oh what am I trying to say is it the way we're talking about the way the Bible's been disaggregated and badly quoted and then used for extremes and the rest of it what protects a neo nugget from having the same thing happen to it? Or a series of neo nuggets happening. How, is that the protocols that help it? How do we? Pre yeah. So, um, no. I'm I'm really interested in comparing notes with Steve Bannon, for example. And I disagree with Steve Bannon vehemently on many things. And I, it turns out, I agree with him vehemently on many things as well. And I think, I think the contrast between neo uh, uh, nuggets is very interesting. It's a tension we actually want to have. We want to have these compared, comparable worldviews. And the more a nugget author can say, as I think Jose would say, this nugget is based on this set of beliefs, is based on this set of beliefs, is based on this set of beliefs down here. And we can kind of point down and say, and here's the, the intellectual structure or the historical structure that I'm making this argument from. The more we can say we agree to disagree and a bunch of people will sort themselves into this pyramid of view and a bunch of people will sort themselves over here. And the twain will maybe have a better conversation and maybe be better at compromising because they can now see their logics, but you're going to pry some world's views out of some people's hands, out of their cold dead hands. They're, they're not ever going to be convincible that their view of how things are structured is, is faulty, wrong, or, 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 or whatever. And then there are a bunch of people who presented with a competing worldview that actually sort of starts to work better. I mean, you just have to read ex-evangelical literature. You know, I follow a woman named Chrissy Stroop, who's an ex-evangelical. She's fabulous online. And, and she's like, you know, the Mormons have a term called uh, and, and your, your shelf breaking. Um, in, in the Mormon world, it's a very internal conversation. And then you'll hear a fact and you'll be like, well, that doesn't really fit Mormon scripture. So I put it on my shelf. Uh, you know, your mental shelf. And then one day your shelf breaks because you've put one too many things that don't fit on that shelf. And all of a sudden you're an ex-Mormon, right? Um, and, and so I'm very interested in those tipping points and, and what we use to compare notes. Uh, and then I'll just bookend all of that by saying, and I actually think that membership and, uh, and emotion trump reason most of the time. It's a thought in my brain, uh, which means the logical argument doesn't usually win the game. It's, hey, all of your neighbors are going to excommunicate you. Uh, a, a, a dear new friend of mine uh, ha, it married a Jehovah's Witness years ago and uh, didn't really do the homework on Jehovah's Witnesses at the time because it was long ago and has been disfellowshipped by her church, which means basically nobody in their social community will now talk to him. And it's really a crisis. It's huge. And I'm like, that's just not a human way to treat anybody. But, but that's what happens when belief systems are in collision. And I don't think that these efforts, our efforts, can solve those things. But I think they might make them more plastic, more malleable, might make the people holding those beliefs a little friendlier to one another. Uh, I think it can solve those things. Not retro really? retroactively. Not yeah. retroactively. Yeah. Right? You're not going to fix anybody's belief system that they've had for 50 years. Yeah. That's, that, that, nothing can do that. But if what we have is, you know, my my twenty two year old uh, stepdaughter who's on her way to Banff uh, just now, um, and her boyfriend having a conversation about protocols and experimentation and belief, and and going through this process of exploring life at this level, it alters how they then communicate to their peers and question their peers and question what the next step is. So I think, yes, we can change that moving forward. So but, in, that, in that sense, it would be a component of critical thinking, for example. Yeah. Yep. I like it.
Well, good. Now that we've solved that, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to interrupt our lovely flow here to say, do we want to structure this in some way so that our next couple calls are a little bit more organized and focused on working on stuff and solving stuff? I'm, I'd be very happy. <laughs> I'd be very happy to, to like narrow in on some of these things. And I, I'd love to prototype a couple of our protocols in the areas we've talked about. I, I just put in the chat a little earlier. Uh, I've created a, a slash. I have already on my website a slash now page, which is my new signature. So at the end of every email, it says slash now, which is a link to my now page where I list out the way too, you know, way too many things that people now put in their email signatures. In our last call, we suddenly thought, oh my God, how about if we had a how page, which mm -hmm. is the how to interact with me, how I work, all those kinds of things. I would love to put one or two things on my slash how page so that we can publish that and talk about it and write about it and say, this is what we mean. This is this is how that might work. I think that would be fabulous. So yeah. um, I'd be up for, Mark Antoine, thank you for, for being on this call. Sorry you have to miss next week, but but we'll continue this. That's, that's great. Um, and, I have to uh, run. My wife I, is stranded with her car someplace. And oh, then, shoot. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks, class. Good luck with that, class. Yep. Uh, so anyway, I'd love to organize this a little bit more so that we have, we're, we're aiming toward a couple of, of work products uh, along the way. I I personally, subsequent to the uh, to the last week's thing, uh, I've gotten really excited about the, the how piece because I think it becomes a very... Uh, easily consumable aspect of protocols where people don't need to think about the deep, you know, ideas, uh, but like, Hey, this is simple. This is how I interact with him. How do I hire him? Oh, okay. That's an easy one. Here's my protocol. How do I connect with him? That's easy. Um, so on and so forth. I think there are, I, I liked the idea personally of protocols not being limited to big governance ideas or to very technical ideas, but to all aspects of life as little experiments that we could all take, that we can share with each other. You know, oh, I like his experiment. I'll adopt that how. Let's do this, right? Um, and, and being able to make all of these protocols very easily adoptable from anyone's expression of their protocol. So not just having to go back to our protocols, who cares about that? Mm -hmm. But seeing yours and saying, oh, that's good. I want to adopt that. And and making that gesture super easy. Like, yes. like, like our protocol should include the copy this over into mine so that I can evaluate it, maybe modify it, but add it to my bucket of protocols. That every protocol, every our protocol should have that uh, ability yes. right at hand. Yes. And that's that's the work we need to do. And so doing some of this mocking up of, of uh, a how, I think would be a really great experiment to um, to get us there. So if, if you'd like to work on that between now and next week, and then also next week, um, talk about it. I, I, I'm game. Cool. Uh, have you seen the, the protocols page that Marc Antoine just put in the chat? It's for scientific uh, experimental protocols. It's a database of protocols. So they may have thought about a lot of the things I said about, you know, specialization and all these relationships might be worth. I think I've looked at it. I'm not, I'm confusing it now possibly with, um, there is a micro format. Yes, I think it's related. I think it's related. Yeah, I think it's related to that micro format. Um, but yes, um, I, I think, by the way, there's a lot of people that are hitting on this at the same time. Uh, this isn't unique to us in any way, shape, or form. I think what's interesting is um, that most of the people that are hitting on this are doing it from a very specialized area. Um, and I think what we're talking about here, both in, in the old books and the old nuggets and, and our protocols, is a very personal human level. Uh, not targeted to a specific domain uh, at the society level. Love it. I was just having a funny thought uh, considering the name Neo Nuggets. Um, what if we called it Nuggetology? It rhymes nicely with Scientology. <laughs> Wouldn't that be good? I don't, 
I don't know if nugget is a such a great we, moniker. We, we've had many a we've had many a conversation about nuggets or elements or building blocks, blocks or whatever. Yeah, we 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 we've, we've we've been there a couple of times, Mark Antoine, as we have on okay. Free Jerry's brain on a couple of different topics like that. Fair enough. I. <laughs> uh, but if you have a better idea, yeah. But it's just it's just that it does seem to always come back to nuggets as uh, as as sort of the thing by default, not because it, anybody feels that it is the best thing ever, but but simply because it's sort of like, oh, that doesn't work as well. And yeah. yeah. So if you come up with a better idea. Yeah. Happy to head back into the territory whenever. Yeah. Cool. So we've got the Mattermost chat for this group where we can plan some. Um, I'm going to suggest that we just sort of use that uh, the NeoBooks channel on Mattermost to sort of talk back and forth between now and next Monday. And then after that, um, a part of me wants to say, what do I need to, should we use next Monday to write a protocol for me for my how page and just pick one and write it out? Is that an exercise we can do with your current sort of our, and I, I see on the our protocols website there's a whole bunch of pro our protocols so uh can we can you teach us how to create one and can we just pick a really simple one to do sure that'd be great sure. yeah that would be a fine thing and and we can get some feedback on on what's there and how it works uh, as well and and that's part of this whole exercise so yep cool other other thoughts of what you'd like to do with all this anybody I still, I, I, our protocol's my baby. Uh, I, I love it, and I'm, I'm glad that we're talking about it. But it's the marriage between these two things that really excites me. So, yep. so I, I don't want to sort of get lost in the weeds of one and not kind of marry the two, because, especially with with Mark Antoine's conversation today, because I must admit um, he lit a little spark in me about this marriage between these two in a in a more unique way than I'd I verbalized it in my own head, which is that there is a an understanding of something and then there is an implementation of something. And that 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 how the implementation how is is this thing and this discovery, this questioning, this wondering, this uh, you know, deliberating um, is is this Nuggets world, and these uh, the the protocols is this implementation world, and, and now I'm starting to see a, a possible, and maybe I'm not being very clear in how I'm describing it, but but there seems to be a, a meta organization between these two things that they're not just simply. Uh, mirror images of each other, but that, that there's actually this interoperability between them, mm -hmm. that one leads to the other and leads to the other leads to the other, and that they can cross-pollinate back and forth. Not I would have put it, but I'm glad you got that out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, as in, I don't think I said exactly that, but that's okay. No, <laughs> but... But it's not what you said. It's what no, exactly. It's what it it's what it evoked in you, which is fine. <laughs> yeah. When back when I used to do a lot of written research uh, for like a dozen years, uh, every now and then I'd bump into somebody and say, "Oh, I love what you wrote in this issue or about X." And I learned to ask, "Oh, what did you learn? What was it?" Because it was fifty percent of the time it was nothing I'd written. Twenty percent of the time it was something I actively disagreed with. Um, but the, but the mismatch between what I thought I was getting out in the world and what was coming back to me was well, I, on a good day humorous, on a bad day distressing. It was very well, funny. So my question is: that, was that distressing, uh, uh, Marc Antoine? <laughs> no, I like it. Absolutely. So so this is causing us all to kind of glue things together in our heads. I, I, this is a very I feel like like little pieces of crystalline matter are starting to get close to each other in, in ways that are fruitful. So that's good. Yeah, um, I think I think when you speak about implementation, do you mean records of how this protocol is applied in this particular situation? Because that's also something 
that's that's different I, than making it specific for the situation. I, I think I, I, that's a very general term uh, as I used it. Um, and conceptually for me, there's this whole space of how we do things. And the how we do things starts with the knowledge of what to do, the knowledge of when we do it, what happens, the knowledge of, you know, how do we pass it along to others, and so on and so forth. There's this whole practical, if you will, um, area that when we think about books, we kind of vaguely paint with a very broad brush what that looks like. Uh, but when we talk about protocols, it it they're precise, right? And they can be very precise and very narrow. Um, and so how do we break things down into these narrow, precise things? How do we see these very precise things as experiments? How do we validate these experiments? How do we do these experiments in parallel so that everybody's kind of doing their own little experiment and they can feel comfortable in knowing that they're running an, an experiment? All of this to me is a new way of thinking about how we do society. Uh, protocols as an extension of human ingenuity that isn't tied to a hierarchy, that is brought to the individual's ability to express and do and collaborate independently of someone dictating what is the right way to do something. Mm -hmm. That to me is, is the nugget of what led to our protocols. How do we do that in a way that can then inform the neobook nugget that may have informed the protocol? Um, I think we talked about this before. I'm not finding it in my notes, and I forget what you said, Jose, but what's the relationship between our protocols and pattern languages? I think there is a relationship that isn't, it, it's not explicit at the moment, because I think pattern languages have a, in, in my view, in my personal mm -hmm. experience, pattern languages have a, a a place that is, here's the pattern for how we can put assemble different things together, and there's all the different little pieces and so forth. I think protocols are more about my relationship with these patterns that's unique to me in my context, in my way of seeing the world. And so we can have a thousand different protocols for the same thing and a thousand different groups of people using the, those protocols. And it works for them in their context. That's unique to their view of the world, unique to their example, their uh, living in the world. And I think patterns have tended to sort of say, well, these are the patterns for everybody. Um, no, there... I'm sorry, sorry. No, please, please, please. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Patterns, uh, my understanding of patterns, I started with the programming, the software patterns, the, the group of four, and they were very clear and, and they were modeled after Alexander's architectural patterns. And it's very much, they always said, here are the forces. You want to use this pattern when, you know, you care more about this than that. And it was very, very clearly circumstantial and subject to different forces. Why would you want to use this pattern rather than this one? It wasn't a universal. And then later, I saw a lot of people doing patterns which are which were more interactional, like, for example, the, the at least patterns for democracy, right? I mean, we're speaking about how do people interact? Now, it's true that the software patterns were, like the architectural patterns, more spatial than temporal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's true that if I think of the behavioral patterns that I've read, I've read a few, they're more about configuration than, you know, steps. But sometimes they go into steps. Like I've seen, like there's 
obviously some software people have gone into um, the, the, the question of how do we share information and how do we reach consensus? And of course, then the steps are extremely important, but it's true that this is a bit more marginal in the pattern literature. Uh, I think there are just different ways of describing things, but mm -hmm. the, the, the pattern description languages are usually the, the ones that follow the pattern of pattern description languages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> They're very explicit about why would you use this one and not that one and when and where. That is very essential to the description. Sorry, that's why I just. But it's but it know. but it but it is. It's a, it's a why rather than a how. Well, it, it starts with a why. Like most patterns, start with in this sort of situation, these tensions arise and these forces are present. In those cases, you might want to try doing this. So they are they're very much about how. And I, and yeah. I love I love good patterns. I think patterns are super useful, and I don't see them as that far away from our our protocols. I, I, I'm struggling with that because when I look at patterns and and, the, and I'm not an expert in any way, shape, or form, but I, I often get lost in the pattern rather than uh, it, it doesn't feel like it's opening up opportunity. It feels like it's sort of hemming. I mean, me in in some way. So my favorite pattern and many times many people's favorite pattern is light from two walls. And it basically says, um, in order to find to feel warm, inviting and convivial, a room should probably have natural light from at least two walls. It's not a rule. And, and one of the things about patterns is that they're just rules of thumb. They're not rules or algorithms or commandments. So patterns come very definitely out of a world of, hey, interpret this any way you want, use the ones you want, throw away the other ones. I and mean, if you're building a media room where you're going to play movies, you can ignore light from two walls because you're going to draw the heavy curtains anyway, right? But, 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 but then it informs all the decisions you're going to make later in a very active way because then you can be in conversation with other people and say, oh, we could do that, except it would violate light from two walls. And I would, I would see it as... Okay, well, light from two walls is it a north facing wall or a south facing wall? That, it, and that, is yeah. it a skylight? Is it uh, you know blah blah blah? And and so for me, a protocol would be more about what's the real world situation that you're in, and can we say, you know, you shouldn't have, for example. Um, in an uh, in a south facing wall, you shouldn't have that wall be more than X if you don't want to deal with uh, uh, being light, uh, right. being uh, an opening. Um, it, otherwise, you're going to have to deal with blah blah blah. But so, there's another there's another pattern about siting your home on a site and which orientation. Like like there is a pattern about wh which sunlight is better or whatever whatever. That's just in a different place. I understand. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that the patterns themselves don't aren't prescriptive if you will of of a of a a way how to do something right and, and i think a protocol mm -hmm. is i'm not so sure that a protocol has to be i think to me the protocol feels like if it's looser it might be just fine so you may have a more definitive deterministic idea of what an r protocol is and you've actually written them so that's part of what I, why i'm interested in experimenting with them Yes, Jax, you're about to jump in. Oh no, I just uh, I think getting actually getting in and actually prototyping is going to be really helpful. And I just put in earlier. I know we've got to wrap up in a tick. Um, yeah. Same and different. We've got to actually identify what is the same. What do we agree on? What do we yes. disagree on? And start to separate those things out. And we've also got to sit comfortably in that grey area between where we, you know, it's neither Absolutely. this nor that. Um, because otherwise we'll you know we can't define we we'll get stuck in that formalism i think that mark antoine was talking about earlier um i'd like to get practical and actually see us put it together and then i think it'll stop us talking around it but this has been absolutely fascinating thank you so much absolutely thank love you it. love I it i need to run i've got a let's, let's all run so run um, thank you this is really you. A, a terrific call bye everybody yeah. thanks everybody bye bye